Uh, Sonny, welcome to our annual Warsaw Conference on Practical Politics, both to those of you who are here in person uh, and to those who are on Zoom, on our live stream, and on Facebook. Uh, I'm Bob Trum, the director of the Center for the Political Future here at USC Dornsife. I'm here with Mike Murphy, my longtime political opponent and friend, and a co-director of the Center. Uh, I believe this conference will be an exciting and revealing examination of the 2024 election and the deeper trends in our politics. But let me turn this over for a moment to Mike, uh, and then a welcome from the Dean. Go ahead. Well, thank you. Whoa, boy, oh boy, it's like Vegas here. All right, we're gonna do it. Anybody from New Jersey? Um, thank you for coming. We really enjoy putting these conferences on. We attract incredible people. Uh, we have President Biden's pollster here, so you can straighten him out, an old friend of mine. Uh, and we're gonna get into a very important topic, the truth in campaigns. We used to have a common set of facts, not so much anymore. So we have some experts, we're doing a panel on that. We're looking at the election year, which is going to be very large. Uh, we'll see how joyful it is. Uh, and all the other important things that uh, we work on and you're here to listen to. So thank you for coming. I hope you have a good time. We encourage questions at the panels. And with that, I'll turn it over to Bob to introduce our esteemed dean. Genuine privilege to introduce the Dornsife Dean, Amber Miller, who's been a tireless supporter of the center and whose idea of the academy in the public square is at the heart of our mission. Dean Miller. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, I know you're anxious to get to the main event, so I will only give a, about 45 minute introductions. <laughs> um, I first, I would just like to start by thanking Hope Warshaw for her generous support. Um, these conferences and workshops have become really signature events for our center. And so if we could just give her a round of applause, I'm not sure if she's here. Um, I'd also like to give a shout out not only to Bob and Mike, whose vision has made this center what it is, but also to the team of the Center for the Political Future, whose tireless work has made it what it is. So thank you to all of you as well. Um, let's just give them a quick round of applause. Thank you. All right, enough clapping. Um, <laughs> so um, the vision behind this center was has been to return some civility and um, fact-based debate to our political sphere. Um, and this center has done an absolutely spectacular job doing that. And I know that um, we are all here for that reason. And, you know, it is, it's just, it's so gratifying and so much fun to have a real debate with hard-hitting um, political perspectives based on, you know, good old fashioned facts and good old fashioned argument. Um, and so that's what we're about here today. Um, and, you know, it just, it is particularly gratifying to me because coming here to USC, one of my biggest goals was to take the kind of expertise and knowledge and drive within the academy and combine that with the kind of expertise and knowledge and drive outside the academy and put those two things together and create a real debate. Um, and that is happening infrequently these days. People tend to think of universities as these remote places where um, stuff goes on that's, you know, probably on one side of the political spectrum and only there. And then there's the real world. And, and that's just not what we're about here. Um, so off to talk about 2024. And I think every year since I've been here, every campaign season has been unprecedented in some important way. Uh, but this one may actually take the cake. Um, so let's hear what our experts think about how and where and why and all that important stuff. Thank you, Amber. Listen, I, at a personal level, I'm grateful for your leadership and friendship. And I think everybody at the center would concur with that and for your constant guidance six years into this endeavor. Okay, we're gonna take about a two minute break. You'll see a little film about the center. The first panel is gonna come up here and we'll be off to the races in about three or four minutes. The divide in politics right now is a, the divide in politics right now is a tribal equation where the argument has become, I'm right and you're evil. And if you're evil, I can say anything about you. Everything you say is a lie. I, I think part of it is that facts have now become debatable. And if it is, in fact, debatable, it is 
not a fact. I think the other part is that we are having conversations about things that are extremely personal and one could argue controversial or inflammatory. Americans had a kind of common knowledge base. You could disagree with what to do about the knowledge, but people generally agreed on the facts. Today, anybody can get any message out there. I can tweet something right now and be arrested in 18 minutes. That speed to amplify good speech, good facts, dumb speech, and dumb facts without a filter, you know, in one way is kind of libertarian freedom, and the other way it can be very corrosive and dangerous. Thomas Jefferson, the author of our Declaration of Independence, wanted people to be skeptical of their elected leaders, challenge them, question them. And the sad thing is, is we've gone from this healthy Jeffersonian skepticism to a corrosive cynicism. We need to do what we can to push back towards the healthy Jeffersonian skepticism. What are the incentives that we need to try to move back in that direction and how to study it both with practical politics and with what we can learn from academic research and the resources we have here? I'm excited that USC is, is stepping up and taking on this endeavor. This is something we all talk about. We all talk about the political divides on our campuses and in our communities. And USC is stepping up and saying, we're not going to wait for somebody else to do it. We are going to take on the task of getting it done. To bring the scholarly resources of the academy together with leaders from the real world of politics and also have them interact with students so that you have an impact on both education and on the society beyond the university's gates. So politics is not just a shouting match and entertainment on cable news. And so this is the place we're gonna try and really address that, learn things, and hopefully be a positive force. Now let me turn to our first panel, which I think is gonna be terrific. It's entitled Primary Colors, or should I say, what the hell just happened? Uh, <laughs> so early and so decisively. Uh, let me introduce our panelists. Uh, Chris Catalago is the former White House correspondent for Politico, who is now Politico's bureau chief for California. Jane Coaston is an op-ed columnist for the New York Times, host of its podcast, The Argument, previously the senior political reporter for Vox, with a focus on covering conservatism. She is a spring 2024 fellow at the center, for which we're very grateful. John McConnell is an eloquent writer, a gifted political analyst, who served as senior speechwriter to both President George W. Bush and Vice President Dick Cheney. We were honored to have him join our center as a fall 2023 fellow. Carissa Smith was national women's vote director in the 2020 Biden campaign and a senior advisor in the Biden White House Office of Public Engagement. She is now vice president of government relations for the Fox Corporation. Uh, when we were planning this conference, I thought it was likely that we would be convening in the middle of a hotly contested Republican primary season. <laughs> so let me ask, and we'll, we'll start, I guess, with John and just go down. Uh, for all intents and purposes, are the primaries already over? Because it seems like we tuned into episode three of a series and found ourselves watching episode 10. <laughs> um, I, I think the answer is yes, they're, prob they're probably over. Uh, I don't, uh, I mean, then you've got Governor Haley uh, coming into a primary in her home state, probably will lose it, and very possibly will lose it by a lot. And that'll, that'll really kind of, um, I think, uh, solidify uh, the idea that uh, uh, she can't really beat Trump for the nomination. Uh, that doesn't mean that she's going to necessarily get out. We've all seen these things play out in different ways in both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. People stay in for their own reasons. And her reason in this case might be, um, maybe something will happen that will cause Trump to fail to have the confidence of his party by the time of the summer conventions. And so I'm going to uh, solidify my position uh, in the anti-Trump or non-Trump part of the Republican Party so that if he loses all credibility or, or however you want to state it uh, in the summer, I'll be there and they'll nominate me. I, I, can, I can imagine uh, that being part of her thinking, but it's hard to, 
it's hard to, in a practical sense, say that this this is still an open race. I don't, I don't see it that so way. So, Jane, why is she still in? Um, I think, I, I mean, first, I'd like to start by saying hello. Thank you so much for having me. Um, second, I think you, you asked, um, you know, I thought that, that you said that you know, you thought this would be in the middle of a contested primary. And my first thought was, did you? Yeah. <laughs> you did? Yeah. Because I think it, it, it was very telling to me that it was in this Republican race, it's Donald Trump and a bunch of people who keep trying to sound like him or argue that they're like, I'm the cooler Donald Trump. I'm the Trump for the new millennium. I'm like, it's interesting to see a bunch of people who are Trump adjacent or trying to run to the right of Trump or trying to run as Trump, but better or Trump, but smarter. And that, that seems to me to be very telling. It's like, if you have a choice between Coca-Cola and new Coke, I think we, some of us might recall how that went. But um, I think that Nikki Haley is now in this for a reason that I, I, I deeply identify with. She's a hater. She's a hater. And this person, I mean, you've heard how Trump talks about Nikki Haley, a right. person who was his ambassador to the United Nations. And this is how Trump talks about basically everyone. But I think that Nikki Haley at this point is the first person who is responding to Trump calling her bird brain, making fun of her name, making fun of where she, you know, of her birthplace, which is the United States. Um, and she is responding by saying, no, I'm not going to just accede to this, especially because the longer this goes on, the sadder it will be if she goes on to at the GOP convention and talks about how great Trump is, which is something that we all know DeSantis is going to do after Trump has basically implied that he was a pedophile and that he knows and that his wife faked cancer. Like even the things you say about how Trump talks about other people makes you sound insane. Like it sounds like you're describing the plot of an episode of the show Nip Tuck. Like everything sounds insane that you're saying. But I think that Nikki Haley is staying in this because I think she recognizes that she will not win the nomination, but she is representative of a large constituency of people who do not like Donald Trump. Now, if you treat Donald Trump as he treats himself as an incumbent, when incumbents go to New Hampshire, they typically win by like, 80, 85%. LBJ went to New Hampshire in 1968 and he got 49%, still beat Hubert Humphrey. He looked at those numbers and said, I'm out. I, I can't do this. This is terrible. And so I think that there are two things that are true. One, Trump has a specific hold on the GOP base. Two, the GOP base is not everyone who votes for Republicans and it is certainly not independents. And I think that Nikki Haley, one, she's a hater. I am also a hater. I understand. Two, she understands that there is a constituency for her. And I think she will hold out if she has the money to do so, because she knows that there, for the eight people among the GOP who are going to vote for Trump, there are two who will never do so. What did you mean by hater? Ah, um, there is an idea. I think that if I, I am slightly younger than you are, um, <laughs> and um, if you uh, spend a lot of time in uh, sports culture or kind of like online culture, there are people who, um, let's say that you really, really, really hate Steph Curry. Now, Steph Curry can do whatever he wants. Steph Curry can win a million championships. You're still going to be like, I hate that guy. It doesn't change anything about his successes. It just means that no matter what he does, no matter how many mountains he climbs, you still are going to say, I hate that guy. And that is something, you know, I, I'm a sports person. I'm a sports fan. Um, I am beholden to the University of Michigan, America's finest institution. Go blue. Go blue. <laughs> and so Ohio State could win 9,000 games in a row. They could be the single greatest institution in the history of sports. And I'd still be like, eh, hate them. <laughs> That's what being a hater is. It's important. Well, I mean, you see it today with uh, all the people going after Taylor Swift. Uh, I mean, it's it's absolutely oh, extraordinary. Started, and um, they have a conspiracy theory that on behalf of Joe Biden, <laughs> the Super Bowl is fixed for Kansas City. Uh, and the Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey are just convenient. They're, it's not real. I think that um, 
If I were to be in charge of the American conservative movement, I would say maybe don't try to fight the NFL. Don't. Don't don't (laughs) fight institutions. Like, you know, in general, trying to do the whole we hate sports things, bad idea. It's not a good idea. (laughs) Okay, so Haley lost although not by as much as people thought she would, in New Hampshire, where independents can vote in the Republican primary, where the electorate gave John McCain a landslide win over George W. Bush in 2000. And shout out to Mike Murphy. He was running that campaign. And where the popular governor, Chris Sununu, was all in for Haley. By contrast, in her home state of South Carolina, the next big test, everyone from the governor to the senators on down have endorsed Trump. And in a poll from Emerson College this morning, uh, Trump leads nationally among Republicans, 73 to 19. Does she have anywhere to go or do you agree with us that it's all over? Yes. Well, firstly, it's so good to be here. Good morning. Also want to just give a disclaimer. Views I express are my own. Carissa Joy Smith. Just want to put that out there. Okay. Um, overall, I just believe, uh, I actually echo the sentiments of my colleagues on this panel, is that I do believe that Haley emerged with this notion that Trump's foothold wasn't um, as concrete as it is. And I feel as though as you are seeing what happened in Iowa, as you're seeing what happened in New Hampshire, it is evident that the former president's brand is still there and his foothold with his constituency and his base is very much so alive and still gaining momentum. I also just think for those who emerge to go against the former president, they have to remember that this campaign or essentially this constituency is now about 10 years in the making. You know, President, former President Trump emerged in 2015 with this base and he has been consistent across the board in his messaging and who he is targeting. He hasn't changed who he is. He's not going to change who he is. And I think overall you are seeing that voters are familiar with him and voters want to stick beside him. I also think what Jane highlighted is key is that you have these other candidates who emerged that essentially are very kind of Trumpish, if I was to put a put a kind of you know, title on it. And in a sense, you even see in her ads, she's promoting, hey, I want to restore law and order. I don't get down with DC. I am someone who's going to essentially bring out this new generation of conservatives. How many times have we heard the former president double down on those top lines as well? We've been hearing it now for close to a decade. And I think in order for her and other candidates who try to come in and say that they were different, it starts even at that strategy and their messaging of how can I revamp and actually be a different um, Republican candidate than Trump. And so I just think overall, there really isn't too many other places that I think she can go, honestly, that where she will see that her popularity will grow because to your point, if you already have old Coke, why would you want to go try new Coke? And I just think overall that all of the candidates have tried to ride the coattails and the momentum of Trump and it has really fizzled out because you can't you can't essentially do, you can't essentially be a ca- carbon copy of what the prototype is. So that's just my stance on that. Chris, you cover this every day uh, and you cover California. And when I was looking uh, at, at the primary landscape as in, in, the, in the next few months, I noticed that California changed its rules mm-hmm. for delegate allocation in a way that it seems to me makes Trump almost a lock, even if something happened. Yeah, this was something that the DeSantis folks, particularly the DeSantis uh, super PAC was pretty up in arms about when it happened. Uh, before, there was a way for him to camp out if he were still in the race as DeSantis and pick off some delegates in particular districts. They changed it to where if the front runner uh, was getting 50% of the vote, it was essentially, uh, they were essentially gonna, gonna take the state and a wipe out. And that's, as you know, a huge amount of delegates. Um, and so, you know, the train had probably already left the station by the time that happened, uh, but it was still a blow. By that point, I mean, you look at like the DeSantis Super PAC, their whole purpose initially was to fan out and take care of these non-early states to sort of set the, uh, uh, you know, set the field for him to continue on uh, and put money into these places where he could have some uh, momentum post early states. He obviously, they then retrenched and were the ones sort of helping out in those early states because his money slowed down on the hard side. Um, for Haley, I mean, the thing about her is that it, it is, she's a hater, I guess, to a point. To the average person out there, you know, you say you're going to vote for him regardless. You say you're going to pardon him. 
you run the same kind of campaign that everybody short of Chris Christie ran, which was to basically kind of uh, treat Trump for the most part with kid gloves. And then you get down to a two on one. And what do you really have left? Well, she's not treating him with kid, kid uh, gloves now. Yeah, but people have watched the last, you know, however many months of this campaign. And she had an opportunity um, besides these process arguments about him not being on the stage or, you know, I'm more electable. That's like not lighting the fire under anybody. You know, I, I can win in a general. Well, Trump's beating Biden by however many points in a general. So people just weren't buying that argument, even if ultimately there was something to it. Um, these polls that had, you know, the New York Times poll, all these, you know, all these polls that had Trump doing pretty well at the time in these battleground states just completely cut into this idea that someone like Haley was the better uh, or the obvious choice. Um, people just also, that's just not how people vote, you know? People you know, are going to go with their gut. They're, they're, so anyway, just to explain sort of, you know, what sidetracked her. I mean, you could spend the next couple of weeks hitting Trump on things, um, sort of probably gets to some criticism of Haley, which is that she's going to take a position that she needs to take in the moment, you know, which has already been a knock on her. Uh, so it's not going anywhere. Yeah, it seems a very, to me, a very different process than, for example, 2004, where Democrats at the end of the day said, actually, who has a chance to beat Bush? And they said, not Howard Dean. And they moved on. Uh, the Republican electorate, or the at least the MAGA portion of the Republican electorate, which dominates the party, seems to prefer Trump, and I would argue prefer Trump even if he wasn't doing very well in the polls in the general election. I think almost all of them would still stick with him. I, Democrats did that in 2020 with Biden. Yeah. I mean, that that's how he yeah. emerged. That, the that South primary. Carolina pri primary was people saying, who is going to actually beat Trump? Not necessarily who do I want spiritually, yeah. but who do I want to beat Trump? And I think that, um, is it okay if I jump in very quickly? Yeah, um, I that's think, what this is about. <laughs> I think one thing that we're underestimating with thinking about polling, thinking about November, mm. is so many Americans, and I totally understand this, are convinced that there is going to be some sort of deus ex machina event that means that it will not be Biden-Trump. Like the number of people, I don't know if you've seen, um, for instance, um, there's been a lot of kind of commentary on the right that like, Michelle Obama's gonna jump in. Huh. <laughs> Michelle Obama does not want anything to do yeah. with this. Like I've seen that so many times yeah. and I'm just like, she doesn't want anything to do with this. Or that like, uh, Nikki Haley has even made the point that like, oh, this is actually about Kamala Harris. Like Biden doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Or that this is actually Barack Obama who is busy doing something else. Um, and I think you see uh, among Democrats that they're like, oh, if we could just get someone else as if they can find that generic Democrat that pulls so well. Like if we could just find guy or nice lady, um, we, could, we could handle this. But I think that the closer we get to November and recognize that this is what is actually going to happen, I think that we're going to start seeing some shifts. And I think that you're starting to see that from, you know, from the White House saying, like, this is what you're going to get. There is not going to be some magical moment that takes Trump away. And I also think that um, something that interests me, and I, I spend a lot of time reading conservative media, is that there's always been this desire, this I idea that yes, Trump was, you know, Trump is what people wanted in 2016. He did some good things that Republicans like, but don't you really want the best, you know, you want a Republican, a former governor, you want a guy who did all these conservative things. You want someone who stands for under the conservative mantle. And what I think a lot of people within kind of, I would say, elite conservatism don't understand is that that's not what their voters want. Their voters do not want the best conservative. Their voters don't remember Ronald Reagan and they don't care. And I think that, that that's something that interests me is that you see all of these people attempting to appeal to the mantle of best conservative. Meanwhile, Donald Trump is out there talking about how, you know, you're, you're too strict on abortion, which let's keep in mind that if he wins the election, that he will not care about any of that. He, you know, he nominated the judges that overturned Roe. But I, I do think that the problem for 
trying to find a replacement for Donald Trump has been that, once again, people don't understand the appeal of Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get to that in a minute. Mm -hmm. But, John, do you want to add anything before I move on? No, go ahead. Okay. (laughs) First of all, I should note, by the way, that the last 15 minutes, 20 minutes of this, we're going to take questions from the audience. And you just line up at the mics uh, if you want to ask a question. So I'm going to build off what you just said. A lot of the GOP's big contributors, and more circumspectly, some of its leading office holders hope to, quote, move beyond Trump this year. At the end of 2022, their choice was Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. He was ahead in some polls. He raised a prodigious amount of money. The answers to this question that I'm about to ask may be obvious and they may be manifold. But why did DeSantis freeze up? Once he left the Florida sun. I'll go first, yeah. Um, I just feel as though that the reality is that the GOP party, um, they haven't been able to divide the, divide the former president's base, right? And so if you're going to go in and essentially target voters, they haven't been able to kind of carve out subsections of possible voters that could essentially turn over to other candidates. And I think that they have been unsuccessful, quite frankly, in breaking through the messaging and quite frankly, that coalition base that I mentioned earlier, that is about a decade in the making. Um, the reality is that even though they have been publicly in opposition of the former president, his actions, his words, even his time as the, as the president, they essentially are seeing that there is a great resistance from what you know people have called the MAGA Republicans, or even as they have called themselves, is that they are still alive, they are still thriving, they are still building a coalition. What we saw even when they weren't, um, even when we saw President Biden win, what we saw is that they even started to target the local state legislators, which has been key. And we're seeing that play out in real time on the ground is that the local and state government is playing a big role in the voter turnout and the constituencies that you're seeing hit the polls and vote for former President Trump. And so I just think it's key that the party, I just think it's interesting that the party underestimated that groundwork that they laid. Like they really had a strong grassroots program immediately after he left office and they never stopped organizing. They utilize these multiple coalitions. They utilize these coalition leaders and various stakeholders to essentially go in, integrate and make sure that that messaging is hitting your front door. I like to call it kitchen table politics. And I will say that I think that they've done a good job of kind of doing kitchen table politics to where the messaging and the branding and who former President Trump is has hit their kitchen table and that is evident. And I think that they have, uh, honestly, in my opinion, organized too late to possibly put up another candidate, whether it was DeSantis, whether it was Haley, um, whether even if at one point it was uh, Sununu, if, you know, when he was in talks of possibly running. At the end of the day, this is a long game that they've played, that they've been strategic on, and that they've done the groundwork to essentially put the votes up now on the ballots. Iowa and New Hampshire are a key indicator that they've done the they've done the ground game. They've hit the doors and they've messaged properly over these last couple of years since President Trump has been out of office. John, you've been through these battles. Talk about DeSantis as a candidate. What happened? I mean, he raised an enormous amount of money. Yes, uh, but but Chris is right. You just you you, you were not going to shake that that Trump base, and DeSantis wasn't all that great on the stump. Uh, I, I there, think that's an understatement. There, there, yeah, there wasn't there wasn't a really good campaign speech, and I'm not singling him out. You haven't heard any good campaign speeches this year. None. And um, it's a missed opportunity. I, I'm saying this as a speechwriter, so I pay attention to these things. Huge missed opportunity. Um, when you have, I think, in the consultant culture, a lot of the uh, a, a lot of the advice you get is be authentic, tweet something. That's what's that's what that's what people want. But it's very authentic, isn't it, to uh, put down your best thoughts and really think through what you want to say and have some good lines and make an argument and engage the audience and have a speech that doesn't necessarily work for every single event, but for you as a presidential candidate will work in most events. You didn't see that, and I think that that's another problem he had. Chris, talk about DeSantis. Yeah, I think for someone like DeSantis, he had the huge win in Florida. He's coming out of that. You see polls where he's up on Trump. A lot of those were actually, turns out, Trump voters who were never going to ultimately vote for DeSantis. You know, his analysis, if you look at the actual numbers, is not totally off, which is that once Trump started to get into the bigger legal trouble and uh, became a, a martyr in that cause, people really did rally around him. I mean, that just 
the numbers show that. The other thing for DeSantis is you come out of Florida and there's a danger that um, you're in this bubble and the, the, the folks around you, and this is getting you know into the, into the internal dynamics, that you're not, you don't have the right folks around you. You don't have people who are telling you what you need to be told versus just what you want to hear. And there seem to be, from the uh, post-mortems of the DeSantis campaign, a lot of that happening throughout the process, um, that he was in this kind of post-Florida bubble and was not able to adjust in real time um, and not able to take the risks that he probably would have needed to take. I mean, he's a young guy. Maybe he felt like, I run through this and I still have some sort of future um, ahead of me. Getting out of the race at the time he did, probably smarter than sticking in. Um, and so, you know, we'll see. There's folks who kind of like the, I don't know if I would put it this way, but like maybe more authentic DeSantis we've seen in the last few weeks, hanging out with his son and um, some of those posts, which maybe humanized him a little bit more um, than during the campaign. So we'll, we'll see. He objectively, having watched the, the prep for the Newsom debate he did on Fox, um, he got better in the debates. He did. he did get better. He got better as a debater. Um, he got better with his arguments, but it was way too late by then. Yeah. I, I think myself that he came across as stiff, wooden, inauthentic. Mm -hmm. uh, Jane, did you hate Ron DeSantis. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I want to be clear. Um, I, I'm trying to separate this because when you're a pundit, it's very easy for you to do the pundit's fallacy, which is that someone something happened because of a thing you happen to care about a lot. I will say I do not like Ron DeSantis. Ron DeSantis was tougher on gay teachers than he was on Donald Trump. Ron DeSantis was tougher on gay kids than he was on Donald Trump. Ron DeSantis was tougher on like the concept of learning about slavery than he was on Donald Trump. I do not like him. I have not liked him. But that that obviously is not you know, why he lost this, you know, why he lost his primary. Because if things I wanted to happen happened, well, life would be a little different. But I, I do think that there are a couple of pieces here. One, I think that Florida is a specific bubble. Mm -hmm. I think that his competitiveness in Florida I think for some national reporters who may not be quite up to date on internal Florida politics, very impressive. But also, let's keep in mind that Marco Rubio won his last race by like, what, 20 points? Mm -hmm. Like, Florida is now, for all intents and purposes, a red state. And Florida also, I think that how Ron DeSantis governs in Florida is not how he was performing out of Florida. Like, for instance, he's done a ton of work in Florida on protecting the Everglades. Um, his environment, I mean, there's the exception of how he um, thought it was super cool if cruise ships dumped sewage in Key West, which the people in the Keys said, not cool. Um, but I think that how he performed nationally, I don't mean perform as in how he did in the polls. I mean, how he got up on stage and said, this is what I, I care about, was so aimed at a very specific audience that was already Trump's. Mm -hmm that it was doomed to fail. Let's remember, how did Ron DeSantis announce that he was running for president? He did not go to Gainesville and announce it at University of Florida football stadium in front of thousands of cheering fans, like a normal person. This is what I would do. He went on Twitter spaces mm -hmm. with Elon Musk and David Sachs. It didn't work. And then when it did work, he talked about Bitcoin. He talked about ESG. Mm -hmm. And he talked about, if I remember correctly, he talked a lot about wokeness, which if you are running for the president of all of America and not the president of the online right, not a great idea. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have Trump saying, well, he talks about woke a lot, which I found lightly funny. <laughs> <laughs> and then let's keep in mind also that you have a campaign um, in which he brings on people, you know, his campaign, uh, one of his campaign spokespeople, uh, Christina Pushaw, is noted for being a giant jerk on the Internet. That's what she does. That's her job. Um, he brings in people 
They're, you know, they, they make online ads, one of which uses the fascist Sonnenrod, which was uh, used in Heinrich Himmler's castle that he had built for himself. Another does this whole thing about talking about how Trump is true pro, too pro-LGBT. Um, and that, and uses a lot of like very online imagery that to the online base, to people who say based on Twitter was great. It turns out most people aren't like that. And so DeSantis tried over and over to go after a very specific audience that was already Trump's. And you've heard this from him saying, I should have done more conventional media. He turned down interviews with National Review because they weren't conservative enough. He said he would only talk about his faith efforts with them. He would not do a wide ranging interview with National Review, a publication that if you've read it over the last year, no one loves Ron DeSantis more than National Review. Members of his own family don't even like him that much. And you saw again and again, him telling Hugh Hewitt, I should have done more conventional media. I should have done bigger interviews because that's what, you know, at a certain point he became guy who is talking to the online right, guy who is guy for online right. And those people loved him. But he wasn't able, in my view, to expand his platform and expand his persona outside of that. And I think that that's something that's worth looking at and thinking about. If you are running for president, you need to have a nationalized persona and one that isn't already the persona of someone else. And that's Donald Trump. So what kind of persona would I, you, you talked about speeches. What kind of speech should he have given? And then we'll leave Ron DeSantis behind just as the voters have. Yeah, I, I, I can't stand here. I can't sit here and really give, give him advice. I, I really think it came down to uh, uh, people didn't, out, out there in Iowa, where he spent all of his time, where he really made his stand. They, he, he, he just, I don't know whether he just wasn't talking about their issues or whether, uh, 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 as, as uh, Jane said, he talked about things that didn't, that, that sort of didn't resonate and, 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 and made people wonder, why is he talking about that? Why not? Why is he, why isn't he talking to the farmers? Um, I just, uh, uh, that 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 Trump base was strong enough out there that he just wasn't going to shake it with all these candidates, and also he stood out as the, an alternative to Trump among how many how many were there more yeah. than a half a dozen, and uh, but he was never stronger as the alternative than on the day he announced for president. And then it kind of all went downhill after that. You know, I think of that moment, and I, I may not get this exactly right where some little girl was eating an ice cream cone and she's trying to talk to him or say something to him. And he said, I'm not sure that sugar is good for you. I mean, some people as politicians just kind of have a natural gift. Who was it? Was it Robert Taft when he was asked for an autograph in New Hampshire and he stopped and explained to the kid why if he gave everyone who asked him an autograph, he would never get anything else done. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and, and, and he didn't win. Right. Uh, but uh, anyways, I said we leave him behind, so we will. The conventional wisdom, Chris, which you alluded to, is that Trump's 91 criminal indictments actually helped him in the primary season. It's an unbelievable thought, actually, if 10, 15 years ago. And his courtroom appearances have almost become a surrogate for his campaign rallies. On the other hand, in the event Trump is convicted in one or more of the criminal cases, Polls indicate he would be almost unelectable. If that happens, if he gets convicted, by that time he'll have a majority of the delegates. Would the Republican convention go ahead and nominate him anyway? Or would they try to move in someone else? I don't think we've seen anything from the party in the last several years to suggest that, uh, one, they would have the poll to do that. I mean, it's... Uh, and the other thing is, if you look at the technical side of this, you know, there's years of appeals. Um, there's him really fighting this. There's nothing showing that folks are ready to peel away from Trump. Um, so I think you just, it'd be wishful thinking on the part of people who want that to happen. 
uh, to think that it will. Um, it gets to Jane's point about kind of this wishful thinking over the last couple of years about this race being um, anybody but Biden and Trump. And so, no, um, it's Trump. Anybody have anything on that? Yeah, I think that um, one thing I I'm always want people to be cautious of is that since 2016, there has been, th there's a reason why people call it conventional wisdom, because it is based on convention. And as conventions change, people start basing their wisdom on that. So since 2016, I think that there's been this idea that if Trump does it, it will help him and it is good. It is not good to be criminally charged. If you are charged for something in a court of law, that's not good, even if you're Donald Trump. It is not ideal that he needs to pay $83 million to a woman he has defamed repeatedly. That's not good. That's not fun. And I think that as I think that it, it's important that for many people who support him, they are not the base. I think we, we talk about Trump's base and Trump's voters interchangeably, but that's not true. There are lots of people who voted for Donald Trump in the kind of like eh sort of way, or they voted for him on a specific issue, or they voted for him for any number of reasons why people vote for things, because most people don't think about politics all the time. But I, I think that we too often now, we treat, um, if anyone's seen the movie uh, John Wick, um, the fine documentary, um, there, John Wick is referred to, and sometimes there's a kind of an ancient idea of Baba Yaga, this unkillable assassin. You know, like he he cannot be. You know, he can't. He doesn't need anything. He can't be beaten. There's any, like that's not who Donald Trump is. Donald Trump since 2016 has lost a lot. He lost the 2020 election. The people he supported lost in 2017, 2018, 2020, 2021, 2022. It, he is not undefeatable. And everything he does or that happens to him is not actually helping him. I think that the people who support him w rally towards him. But I think that's in the same way that if we recall, um, Bill, you know, after the Monica Lewinsky scandal, Bill Clinton's support went up because there was kind of that like, you know, we rally towards him. But that's not, you know, you think about it after a while, you're kind of like, that's not like people liking him more. It's like people going towards something that seems threatened. It's their decision that feels threatened. And I think it's important to remember that for many people, you know, independent voters, people who don't pay attention to politics, at a certain point, there is a moment where you're like, wait, this guy's been charged with this many things. And they're going to say, I could probably vote for somebody else. Or they might, you know, their vote for Trump might not be in support of those things taking place. Well, that's a that's a good point you made about it's not a question of whether people are liking him more. Yeah. I grew up in northernmost Wisconsin in a very uh, small town. Uh, uh, it's very rural. It's uh, uh, an old fishing village. We're between a national park and a national forest. So it's not what you'd call a population center or a swing area. In fact, uh, Bayfield County, Wisconsin, where I'm from, it has been for 90 years one of the most reliable Democratic counties in the nation. And um, it didn't matter whether the Democrat was conservative or liberal or what, whatever. It, it didn't matter. They would clobber the Republican. Barack Obama beat uh, John McCain by 29 points in that county. Typical. Biden beat Trump by 14 points in that county. Uh, Hillary Clinton beat Trump by eight points in that county. A lot of people in that county and a lot of people all over the country voted for Barack Obama and Donald Trump. And we need to think about what, what they are telling us. Yeah. And after the 2016 election, a friend of mine said, you know, people will vote for somebody they don't like. They will never vote for somebody who doesn't like them. And that's what you think happened, especially with Hillary Clinton. I think so. I, I, without question, you, a, a lot of people. And I think that's one of the dangers for President Biden right now. I, I believe uh, that he is uh, making a mistake in giving speeches, not just about Trump, but about Trump's supporters. Yeah. I don't think he should run for president talking about how, uh, how you don't like half the country. Uh, but it, Trump it, it doesn't president saying that he doesn't like half the country. I, I don't think so. I mean, when Hillary Clinton said uh, that, uh, you know, 
Trump supporters were deplorable. That day, Trump said, I love all of Hillary's supporters. I love them. But that's not, and, I mean, I think that that's not what he's saying now. I mean, you've heard him talk, constantly talk about how, you know, ra various people are rapists or that there are, you know, he's going to kick out all of the people who are in, you know, in some ways un-American. And so, I mean, no, I, I totally, a, I totally agree with you, but, but I think that, um, the, but, yeah. Yeah, Trump, and, and we, we, all, we all, you know, you have politicians talk about issues that move them and mm -hmm. people who make them angry and everything else. But when you're talking about your opponent's supporters mm -hmm. and talking about them as part of the problem, I just don't think that's good politics. People, as I say, they'll vote for somebody they don't like. We know that. But getting them to vote for someone who doesn't like them is a very tall order. This actually relates, though, uh, to the Taylor Swift moment, because um, you saw someone you, you've seen um, fairly. You know, I believe it was Matt Gates who said, um, we don't need Karens, as in we don't need white suburban women because we've got Jamals, as in black men, which one? No, you don't. And two. Yes, you do. Um, and so I think you've seen there's been an interesting I think that we don't talk enough about in electoral politics is the role that gender plays. And I think that you have seen one thing I find, you know, there's been a lot of talk about how some African-Americans are becoming more conservative. But if you break those numbers down, it's African-American and Latino men. Hmm. Um, I remember looking up the uh, approval ratings for Trump in the state of Pennsylvania for women, and it was um, six percent. Like all of the black women in the state of Pennsylvania who like Donald Trump could fit in one room. Um, and so I, I think it's important to remember that th there has been, and we've seen this among some conservatives, this idea of like, they don't, you know, of talking about how terrible Taylor Swift is or Taylor Swift fans or single women. Um, you saw both J.D. Vance and Matt Gates talking about how pathetic single women are and how women who are in support of abortion rights should be at home microwaving meals for their cats. And so, and, you know, I just keep thinking about like, and then when, you know, when women do not, and we saw in 2022, when women do not support Republican candidates, they're like, I don't know how this happened. And I think, I mean, again, people will not vote for someone who says repeatedly that I don't like you. And it is once again, interesting that there are certain audiences and we, we see this with conservatism i think we see this with the left as well where it's like we can talk about this group of people as being useless and unlikable and it won't matter but you know it turns out those people vote and if you're you know a white woman a woman in general and if a woman especially in the suburbs and there's one party that keeps repeating how they care about issues that matter to you and one party that thinks that you're an ugly slut, I don't know who you're going to vote for. <laughs> who could it be? Well, that's right. Got to speak to the whole country. Either of you want to get in on this? Um, I was just going to add, I think that you both of y'all raised some really key points about kind of going after the voter and making sure you're intentional in your messaging with them. Some of the things it was just reminiscent of 2020 is that, you know, there were these constituencies, particularly in the multicultural, multi-generational constituencies that turned out to vote and they put us at the victory level in certain margins, you know, and I think overall that was key in the way that we approached them. It was key in the way that we did intentional outreach with them. It was key in the spokespeople that we had in their communities and going to talk to them essentially at their doorsteps. And so I think what you are seeing now, it's kind of funny um, about the Jamal comment, because the reality is that I do believe that you shouldn't take any voter for granted or a possible voter for granted. Granted, there are going to be some key issues where there is division. There's going to be key issues that we're not going to agree upon. But I do think in the way that you do outreach to them should be intentional. Are you really speaking to them from a place where there's understanding? Are you speaking to them from a place where you have um, integrated equity in mind about maybe their circumstances or systemic oppression that affects how they live and how they go along in their livelihoods? These are all key things. I don't think it's a one size fits all. And I think it's interesting that what you see, it's interesting because I think actually Trump has kind of done a good job in this one size fits all. Our former president has, excuse me, former president has done a good a good job as this at this one size fits all for his base and his voters. But I think that's very specific to his base and his voters who follow him. I do think on the other side, as far as the Democratic Party, we have to be intentional about going out there and having intersectional approaches to who we are messaging to because we are not a monolith of voters. It shows that in our constituency, it shows that in the way we engage and the way that we vote. And at the end of the day, we are. Seeing 
seeing even on state and local level is that issue voting or, you know, one issue voting is becoming very prominent. And as you see, as women are turning out to the polls, there are key issues that they are voting on and they are making their voices heard in um in comparison to male voters. And so I think that is something to take note of. I will also just say as a woman of color, as a black woman, we are the cons you know the consistent base on the democratic side. We never falter in where we vote. And so I think also that is something to think about is where also is your base and are you making an intentional effort to invest in them so you can expand that voter base as well? Because we always show up and we vote as black women. 94% in 2020, we did it. And we're going to, probably gonna to continue to do it. So that's you know just my take on it as well too. And just to, yeah, just to kind of state the obvious, and I didn't say it before, the things that can help Trump and and probably have in the primary are a lot of the same things that could be huge vulnerabilities for him in a general. So, yes, he's he's lost a bunch of times. His candidates have lost a bunch of times. Um, some of his supporters don't think he lost the last one. Um, so there's that factor, too. Um, but, yeah, all these things can can come back to bite him and would his would his uh, uh, campaign prefer he not be in this situation with all of these uh, trials either already happening or, or over with or coming up? Of course. Um, but those things also, you know, had an effect of, of rallying um, some of his hardcore supporters around him um, and, uh, you know, may hurt him in this in this general environment. Okay, I'm, I'm going to build off something you just said and talk a little bit about the future of the Republican Party after this primary process is over, <laughs> which everybody seems up here seems to agree. Uh, in Iowa, two-thirds, and I want to get these numbers right, two-thirds of Republican caucus attendees in the entrance polls said the 2020 election was illegitimate, that Joe Biden was an illegitimate president, and... In the New Hampshire survey, 58% supported full pardons for all those, quote, arrested for their participation in the riots at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. Both groups voted overwhelmingly for Donald Trump. What does that tell us about the state of the GOP? And is there any prospect, and I'm going to allude to the person you say they don't even remember here, and is there any prospect in the near or medium term that, we, that what was once the party of Eisenhower, Reagan, and the Bushes will return to being what Chris Christie has called a normal conservative party? Who wants to start? No. Um, I think that parties don't have to be the way they've been. Um, we have had other political parties before. Um, you know, there used to be the Whig party. And there, you know, there have there used to be the Democratic Republicans. What parties look like isn't set in stone, and so I think that the challenge the GOP will has. And to be clear, I think that there there's no way par parties don't tend to go backwards. Um, the Democratic Party is not going to become the party of Jesse Helms again, which great. Um, I think that the Republican Party is not likely to become the party of Ronald Reagan again because Ronald Reagan won the 1980 election. That was 44 years ago. Um, I was not alive. And so I think that moving forward, I will be interested to see if not not about going back to something, but if the Republican Party is going to face a conflict over, is it a conservative party and what does that mean? Um, I had a conversation several years ago, the writer, um, Matthew Continetti, um, who writes in a bunch of places, he wrote a book on the history of American conservatism. And we did a podcast and I asked him, I was like, so what is conservatism? And he was like, to be honest, and I've been working on this question and I think of myself as a conservative, I don't know. And you see a lot of people who have this, you know, you, people, you hear about neocons or you hear about populism or you hear about like all of these different strains of conservatism and they all hate each other and they all screaming at each other on the Internet. And so I think that the Republican Party is facing what would seem to be an ideological crack up. But they have the thing that does bind them, which is anti-liberalism. And I don't mean liberalism like classical liberalism. I mean like liberals. 
And I think that what that means is that the Republican Party, which has always functioned very well as an opposition party, um, they are great if it comes to opposing a Democratic president. Um, they are not so great when it comes to putting together their own agenda. Um, this is why there hasn't been an updated GOP platform in, what, eight years? And so I think that my my thought is that there are going to be some who want the Republican Party to function as a reactionary party. And a reactionary has a very objective, uh, um, an objectionable sound to it. But like, if you are acting purely in reaction to someone else, that is reactionary. And there are going to be lots of people who are interested in that. And there are going to be lots of people who are not interested in that. And so I think that something that's been fascinating about Donald Trump is that he has functionally made both parties way bigger tents than they intended to be. Um, the Republican Party now includes a bunch of people who vote basically only for Trump um, and don't vote for anyone else, and they have never identified as conservative, and they don't really care about like abortion or war or anything like that. And there are a lot of people who vote for the Democratic Party who are like Bill Kristol. Um, and so what I think that the Republican Party is going to face is a real question of not who do you hate, but what do you care about? And th they can probably, you know, push off having to answer this question because they'll be like, we care about beating Democrats. But at some point, there has to be an answer to that question. Yeah, um, your old boss, George W. Bush, said he was a compassionate conservative and he tried to kind of redefine what conservative meant. Is that all gone and gone permanently? No, um, I don't think so. But it's always going to the Republican Party is always painted as so much worse than it used to be back in the good old days when Reagan was there, back in the good old days of George Bush. Um, in uh, 2008, our nominee was John McCain, who was John Kerry's first choice, as I understand it, for his running mate. So the Democratic nominee of 2004 wanted, the man he wanted to be his running mate was nominated by the Republicans four years later. And then it was, God, look how conservative and awful the Republican Party is. They've gone off the deep end. Then Mitt Romney comes in and it's Joe Biden saying he wants to put, Romney wants to put blacks in chains. It's always the same. Every, every four years, I've, I don't recognize the Republican Party anymore. It's terrible. It's awful. They've got so far off the deep end. Um, and so that's one part of it. We're always going to hear that. But the second part of it is there's, um, as Jane said, there's issues that divide Americans. Uh, and that's the way it is because we're, a, we're a, a, a diverse country and country, a free country where, um, you know, if you're a pro-lifer, if you're pro-choice and the biggest thing for you is access to abortion and maybe even taxpayer funded abortion, you care about it that much. It's obvious who you're going to vote for. And if you're a pro-lifer and you think that the community has an interest in the child waiting to be born, there's no question. If, it, if it's number one for you, there's no question how you're going to vote. And the final point is uh, Trump, as has been pointed out here, uh, has a bond with the Republican base that is quite uh, strong. And uh, it's, it's rare in history. It's not unprecedented, but it's rare in history. He has that. And so he's on his way to um, being the nominee, it seems. But, and at the same time, he has real vulnerabilities in the general election, which are, which are also clear and understood. But we also know that if virtually anyone else who was running in the primaries uh, was now the presumptive nominee of the uh, party, they'd be beating Biden by a lot. And so I think that the fortunes of the party looking forward are, are, are not quite as, as, um, as grim as they might, uh, as they might look. Yeah. Well, I don't want to throw this to Chris, but I do have to disagree slightly with you. If DeSantis was the apparent nominee, I'm not sure he would be beating Biden. Um, but he, but he was. I, I mean, while point, he was in the race, before yeah. people saw a lot of them. Yeah. I mean, okay. it's really bad in politics if the more you campaign, the less they like you. <laughs> uh, Chris, future of the Republican Party. Yeah, I mean, I tend to agree. I think we look at these things as uh, this is where the party's at. They've they've lost these specials, and it, it did far worse in the midterms than uh, than they should have. But you know, to make a prediction um, right now based on this grip that Trump has over the party. Um, 
even looking at some of these folks who have run down ticket from Trump, uh, they've obviously been impacted a lot by the specter of Trump there. But, um, you know, Republicans have had some some strong House candidates. They've had some strong Senate candidates. Um, he performed well in uh, various parts of the country. Look at Florida. I mean, Trump is not... Uh, Trump is not the reason that Florida has gone the direction it's gone. Um, and so to sort of write off the party into eternity, I think, is, uh, is you know. We got foolish. a problem in California, though, don't we? <laughs> yeah. Um, California is probably a, a different story. Um, we'll see about, about that. Um, but even in California, I mean, a statewide office, maybe not the governor's race, but in a in a post-Trump environment, there's not to make this about California, but there is a, a strong argument to be made about a a very clear one-party state at the state level and needing some balance there. And so there might be someone down the line who could who could make that argument. You know, I think the only the problem, if, if you had, given the tax burden here, yeah. if you had a fiscally conservative, socially moderate uh, Republican candidate, I think that person could conceivably be competitive in California. But I don't know how they get enough Republican votes in the jungle primary to make it into the November finals. I mean, that's that, I think that's the dilemma. Uh, I talked to a friend who was uh, asked by the Republican Party after the 2010 elections here to help them do an autopsy on what went wrong. And he left after the first half day because they all decided that what went wrong was they hadn't been conservative enough on social issues uh, and, 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 and women's rights and choice and LGBTQ issues. Carissa? Um, I feel like as we're talking about the GOP party in the future, one, I, I'll be honest, me personally, I don't think about the GOP party in the future. <laughs> I really focus on my constituency and the communities um, that I, you know, uh, I should say integrate my efforts to. But in all seriousness, I think that overall we are just kind of in this dispensation of post-Trump in this era of Trump, if I was to categorize it. And I'm not saying that to uh, discredit the foundation or institution of the GOP party. In fact, even earlier when we were talking about particularly black men being Republicans, actually my father is a Republican and I come from generationally black men who are Republicans, um, but they are from Mississippi, right? So there's a lot of factors that weigh into how they came to their political ideology and the way that they voted at the ballots. I think I've done a good job of shifting that in recent years, but <laughs> nonetheless, um, I say all this to say is that I think overall we are just in this dispensation of Trump and I think we have to also monitor what's happening kind of statewide and even in Congress. We saw the fallout, fallout of even the election of a House Speaker and how that played out where you had the divisiveness in the House chamber and in the Senate chamber and where that ultimately left the party when they are essentially taking over the gavel and there wasn't any stabilization of their party in the House chamber. So I think overall, if the future, if I was to categorize or give a suggestion to the future of the, the GOP party is what the stabilization look like and how could they as a coalition or as a caucus come together and present a united front that is stable at least. And I think the start of this, um, the start of the gavel and the whole fallout of the speaker, um, especially with McCarthy, uh, really I think gives a clear indicator to how that divisiveness is going to continue to play out if there isn't, I, I should say, a corralling or a convening that puts everyone on the same track as a party. And that, and that could happen on our side too, right? Like we all have, I think, uh, inside uh, deviants, if that's what you want to categorize them, or insiders of a party who essentially have their own ideology or have built these kind of sub-caucuses. And I think it's important that even if you have these sub-caucuses that don't necessarily agree with your ideology and your political views totally, that when it comes time to vote and when it comes time to be a united front, that everyone gets in line and votes the same when it matters. And so that to me is just my take on it, but I also would apply that to the same of our party as well, because we could very well be in that same instance. Bob, right. I also, isn't it true that so it, the presidential level is so important when it comes to uh, 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 a party that that might be struggling or unraveling, and if you if you lose one presidential race after another, it really starts to rattle people about the future. And I think about the Democrats in the '80s, and they were talking about the remember the Wall Street Journal in 1991 talking about the Republican firewall. 
And there's no way the Democrats- And California was a big part of that. That's right. And there was no way the Democrats could win the presidency. And I still remember reading that. I was, it was my first job. I was in the Bush Quail White House. And I read that and, and I thought, when someone says that this party can't win, no matter what, that means they're not thinking. And sure enough, in the next presidential election, Bill Clinton, the Democrat, with 43% of the vote, Dukakis had gotten 44% of the vote and lost 40 states. Clinton got 43% of the vote and won, what, 30 states, a nationwide electoral college landslide and a a complete rebirth and uh, in in some senses remaking of the Democratic Party. And uh, just when um, uh, just when it, it, it looks grimmest, uh, is if, if, if you find the right talent at the presidential level, and it's not just the candidate, but it's also the people behind the candidate, uh, then everything can change. I was going to leave people with this thought, too, when it comes to the House and leadership. We have no idea what it would look like in a post-Pelosi Democratic caucus in the House. I mean, you win a slim majority in the House. Is it anywhere near as easy for uh, Hakeem Jeffries and the new leadership there to keep folks in line um, in the Democratic Party. And so I think it's, you know, we're looking at the presidential level where you, you even look at Congress and um, it may look a lot less functional than it did under Pelosi um, in this new environment with, with new Democrats being elected. And we may have a different view about how lockstep the party is um, in Congress and, and also in a post-Biden Okay, before I get to audience q and I want to do two other things. Mm-hmm. Uh, first, I've ignored the other half of the primaries. Uh, so despite his approval numbers and complaints about his age, which, as Jane pointed out, I frankly and exactly resemble, uh, <laughs> there was no serious challenge to President Biden's renomination. He won a, a big write-in victory in New Hampshire where his name was not on the ballot. The Democrats do have a strong bench. Why didn't any serious alternative emerge, and I'm not talking about Dean Phillips, and enter the Democratic primaries? Anyone? I mean, I think people like to go with the winning candidate. I mean, President Biden did it in 2020, and I think the expectation is there that he'll do it again. He has proven to be the former president, former president Trump. And so I think overall that even though we have a strong bench, like I think as a party, when you look to the wins as, as far as legislative, as far as the candidate, um, as far as politically, is that President Biden has shown up and has delivered. Now, granted, we could all have feedback about his performance. We could have feedback about areas in which he can prove, but that's any elected official. I think overall, we are seeing that he is delivering. We are seeing that people are still going to turn turn up and vote for him because they trust him. They are familiar with him. And I think overall, we're seeing the same momentum start to pick up that he had in 2020 when it was a crowded primary, right? At one point, he was on stage with about eight to 10 other candidates. And in the end, he was able to clear that stage and it was only him there. So I overall just think as we are looking to it and as people have comments about his age and things like that, the reality is that people do love experience and they do love wisdom, um, especially if you are, I think, a voter who's really engaged on the issue. Not only is the presidency a domestic job, but it's an international job. And even with the global um, turmoil that's playing out, you see that President Trump with that amazing foreign relations experience has come through and has shined particularly globally as well to put us at a stabilized, as a stabilized uh, nation, I would argue. So I think overall, um, even though we have a strong bench, I think even that strong bench is getting in line and supporting the candidate that has done something they haven't done. If we had somebody on the bench who has been proven to be president, uh, former President Trump, sure, by all means, but no one else has done it yet. I think also um, one thing that I'm always interested in is that when you talk to some Democratic voters and, you know, they talk about the polling, about how, like, you know, any generic Democrat would beat Donald Trump. And you're like, OK, give me generic Democrat. And you, you can you can list off people who are potential options. You can talk about uh, Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. You can talk about Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro. You could talk about 
California Governor Gavin Newsom. Um, and Gavin Newsom is always fascinating because it's like that that DeSantis Newsom debate was lightly hilarious because you really got the element of like why so many people love to hate this person and why so many people hate to love this person. Um, but I think the challenge is that if you are a Democrat, you recognize that you are playing in between uh, a very you have a very narrow band with which to play with a candidate. Um, you saw in 2020 that you had a host of people who were, I mean, I, there's an argument that Joe Biden is the furthest left-leaning president we have ever had in a lot of ways. But that just shows like kind of how polling and how people have moved. But um, you saw in 2020 that you had a host of candidates from Beto O'Rourke to Elizabeth Warren who were advocating for positions that in 2020 were you know, widely heralded by the Democratic Party. And then you had Joe Biden, who seemed among those people more conservative. Well, that's what won, because I think that especially in South Carolina, the voters realized that what Americans writ large wanted was someone who seemed not insane mm -hmm. and someone who was who seemed more stable and someone who was not the most left leaning person in the pack. Mm -hmm. And so. I mean, I think it's also just it, it, you know, it's really hard to say how any candidate would do who isn't Joe Biden. But I keep thinking about like Gretchen Whitmer. Well, she's a woman. So who knows? Or Josh Shapiro or any of these candidates. I mean, we saw again, Ron DeSantis on paper sounds like the gr a great presidential candidate. It re like governor of a successful, thriving state. He goes national and he goes. And so. I think that the challenge you have is that bench is hypothetical. It's kind of like how everyone's favorite player is like the number two quarterback, because who, who, they could be amazing until they're the number one quarterback. And then they throw like three interceptions and you're like, I never want to see this person ever again. <laughs> and so I, I think that, that that's the challenge that Democrats have is that you have a pretty deep bench. Mm -hmm. But one, if you're Gretchen Whitmer, you have unified control of the state of Michigan for the first time since the 1940s. Why would you run for president? You, you're you're going to do things in the state of Michigan that no one has been able to do since, like, you know, the Roosevelt administration. So I think that for a lot of this bench, they wisely recognize that their national, you know, how they play in their state is different from how they play nationally. It is safer to stay where you are. And also, we just don't, all of this is hypothetical. We just don't know. Yeah, there's an SNL skit that kind of gets at you. I don't know if people have seen it with all the other names that come up. And then in the end, they end up with Biden. It's kind of a, um, yeah, I mean, you look at Biden sort of longer term, and I know Anzalone will probably get a, a question about this, but you hit the point, you know, he's, he's, his favorables are higher. He's, he's in, the, in the black, so to speak, for, for uh, well into a year. He hits the Afghanistan withdrawal in the, and the bottom just falls out. Um, even at that point, right, you still have an argument to be made about uh, look at the elections in, in France and where um, Macron's approval rating was before winning there. And it was all kind of, um, you know, defining the opposition, which is a big part of this campaign. Um, you have this factor of even if one of these folks were to get in, I mean, the best, uh, argument for why they didn't probably is Dean Phillips, right? Um, his stump speech is sort of like, I love and respect Joe Biden, but he can't win or look at this poll, look at that poll. That's like what he's resorted to saying now, um, which is not moving anybody. I mean, he got smoked by this right in and then even doing something like moving South Carolina to the front of the pack for Biden, you know, doing it through the, through the DNC would make uh, tactically, things very, very difficult for anybody who was gonna was gonna challenge him. Um, so yeah, it was just it, being one of these Democrats who has the, presumably a future in front of them, and potentially being blamed for, if not beating Biden, weakening Biden enough, which Phillips has not been able to do, um, that he m could lose to Trump as a, a hell of a legacy to have um, and not a very attractive one for somebody who could wait and, and see. And in a strange, perverse way for them, 
you know, Trump gets reelected and they're all running for president the next day. Um, so there's a lot of incentive to, to wait and not a whole lot to get in. Uh, let me follow that up with my last question before we go to Q and a, uh, the university of Michigan consumer confidence index, uh, has risen 29% in just two months. That's the biggest jump in more than 30 years. A Fox news analysis of 1800 voters, Republican voters in New Hampshire found that a third of them said they wouldn't support Trump in November. Uh, is the narrative about to change a little bit here as Biden seems to be inching up in the polls? I, I think a concern I have sometimes is, and I see this often um, among some on the left, is an idea, and I, I think that part of this is because I'm very online, and so I see a lot of, I have a lot of interactions with the online left, which is unfair to the left. But my concern is that the economy improving, which is good, sometimes to some people, it's the same reason why people say that like they hate Congress, but they like their congressperson. People will tell you that the economy is bad, but their personal economy is good. <laughs> Because when they're saying that the economy is bad, what they are actually, in my view, saying is that I want X and Y and Z to change. I want these different things to change. And until those things say change, I will report that thing is bad. Um, I think it's also interesting that if we had the economy that we have now under Trump, Trump would be tweeting about it every 15 seconds um, and tweeting about the stock market. And that would not, that would not make the stock market it has tethered, you know, any more tethered to how individuals are doing. But I do think that how people perceive the economy and how the economy is actually doing are two different things. Like for many people, people will still say like, you know, inflation is still an issue. It is. Stuff is too expensive. It is. Though that exists at the same time as the economy being better and inflation is improving, but it's still high because of, you know, a global pandemic. And so I think that, I think you will start to see the narrative change. Um, it's interesting because, you know, when you're in the media, you are right, you are creating the narrative. So me saying like, I think the narrative will change is like, hmm, I think that I will say more things like this and not like that. Yeah. Um, but I do think that the, the reality of how, you know, of what Trump means to Americans who didn't vote for him and the reality of how, um, you know, it's, it's, it's funny because there's always people who are like, oh, gas prices. Gas prices are down. Um, in Salt Lake City, uh, where I live, uh, it, it's about like, what, two fifty dollars a gallon? Um, I'm aware it's not like that here. I know that. <laughs> I know that. I know. I know. It's the same way, like, in D.C., they always take a picture. There's, like, one gas station that's near Union Station, and it always is, like, $4 a gallon. And I remember, like, Wolf Blitzer took a picture of that. And, like, you know, that's, like, the one really expensive one. Everyone the knows one that. by the Watergate. The one by the Watergate. Yeah, it's always that one. Um, and so I think that it, it's worth getting at what we're saying when we talk about the economy. Are we talking about how we are doing? Are we talking about how, like, you know, the economy is good, but homelessness is up. And like, what does that mean? I think that it's important to break, you know, the economic conversation is a cultural one, just as much as an ec it's an economic yes, one. Yes, that is so true. I, I just, you know, uh, uh, and I go back to 92, the year Clinton got elected. Uh, the, the, the fourth quarter of 92, economic growth was 6%. Uh, and there, there had been a recession that had ended a year and a half before. But a huge number of Americans said we were in a recession. And that, you know, so President Bush running for reelection, <laughs> he couldn't say, look, the recession's over. The economy's doing fine yeah. because it would have been, the, you know, the, the reaction was, are you out of touch? Uh, are you not uh, aware of what's really going on in the country? So that's exactly right. It's what uh, it's uh, it's it's what uh, um, the American people uh, think it, uh, the economy is is uh, it's not necessarily what what the numbers are uh but i think um uh as bob mentioned uh those uh consumer confidence numbers having changed so much uh that that, that will affect mm -hmm. the uh the narrative and 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 have an influence on the outcome yeah it's 
Biden's in a tough spot right now because uh, he, you know, like you say, he can point to, as Trump probably would, the stock market or all these indicators that uh, suggest um, things are turning around or getting better. But then he risks um, looking at a step with how people actually feel in much of the country. There's still a lot of, um, uh, you know, they feel like things are very much in chaos still, especially with what's going on around the world now. Um, which Biden is presiding over. Uh, best case for him is probably that he and surrogates go out there to these early states. They talk about what these programs that he has passed um, are doing for them in their lives, and that these numbers start to catch up with how people feel when we get closer to the election, and that that kind of comes together in a bigger argument for him. Um, versus starting out right now just pointing out these these um these figures that may not jive with how people feel yeah can i ask anybody who's gonna wants to ask a question to line up at the mics yeah uh and, and mm -hmm. uh carissa you want to add anything yeah Should i go to audience um, questions i just want to close out with this portion of just saying i think also I actually think maybe the president has a really good window right here to really think about this outreach in which you outlined, Chris, is like, what does this targeted outreach look like? Can you build a multi-generational, multi multi ethical, um, you know, sorry, multi ethnic coalition to essentially turn out and vote? And I think to your point is that you have to target these key states and talk to them about what their kitchen table is feeling. The reality is that even though you're shouting these top lines and these figures, if my kitchen table doesn't feel it, if my mother doesn't feel it, if my abuela doesn't feel it, in her mind, the economy is still a harsh reality for her just trying to make it paycheck to paycheck. And so I think overall, this is where over the party, the caucus should think about what does that intentional messaging look like? What do the surrogates look like? And even who the surrogates are, right? Like it's all about the spokesperson, the medium, and what could a fresh, unconventional way of reaching people with these wins of the Biden-Harris administration look like? And so I would also implore that of like, what exactly may be the strategy as they've seen the success coming out of New Hampshire? What exactly is the strategy for them as they look to the upcoming November election to really, really use this time to um, quite frankly brag on what they've done, but brag in a way that's intentional, brag in a way that's specialized, brag in a way that essentially reaches those who aren't necessarily going to whitehouse.gov to read the fact sheet, who aren't necessarily going um, necessarily to Twitter. Are there other you know ways of traditional press and uh, you know I would even say non-traditional press to meet people. How can you activate those type of voices so this message is getting out? Because the reality is that people are also, I think, civically apathetic in this moment. And you see that especially um, with the younger voters is that you'll you see a clear uh, decline in voters who were enthused to vote, who said they were going to vote. And right now it's kind of plateauing. And that's just specific to the younger voters I'm talking about. Um, and I would wonder how they are essentially going to do some targeted outreach to gain back that enthusiasm and to essentially message exactly how this economy is working for them. Because as someone, my parents are not necessarily looking to the Wall Street numbers to decide. They're looking at what their paycheck is to be able to afford groceries or get gas in their car. And so I would be curious um, how they use this moment and this window to brag, I should say, and also message properly to specific constituencies what they have done and how they have turned the economy uh, to a better place. Uh, we're going to we'll start over here. Given my ideology, we'll start on my left. <laughs> <laughs> Um, hi, I want to go back to the issue of the uh, political con contributors, the ones that gave to other Republicans besides Trump, whether it's the DeSantis people, the Koch Network, which threw money at Nikki Haley. What do they do now, do you think? Do they cave and give to Trump? Do they focus on Congress and the state houses? Do they sit this one out and wait for future election cycles to invest? Any guesses on that? Who wants to take that? You know, I, I just don't know the answer. I, I, I'd have to go back and look at what they did four and eight years ago. Uh, did they, did, there are people who will say, look, I'm a party person and this is where my money's going. I didn't want that one, but we're going to fall in. And there are going to be plenty of other people said, who would say, are you kidding me? I'll bet it's the identical pattern this time, but I don't know what it is. Well, uh, yeah, I'm glad that Jane brought up about the Lyndon Johnson race in 1968. I actually... Like Bob, remember back then, every, everybody thought that Johnson for sure was going to run for re-election because of his ego. He would have been longest serving president since Franklin Roosevelt, et cetera. So my question is, let's assume hypothetically that Biden doesn't really want to run for re-election, that he knows about his own health and the stresses of the office. 
how would he go about doing it? How would he go about, and, um, and when, communicating to the country that he wasn't going to run? I was wondering if it would be most plausible for him to wait until all the Biden delegates are chosen so that there's not a divisive, contested primary, and then announce his preference for a successor to um, the Biden delegates. I wonder if I've never seen anybody talk about that, if they ever think that is a plausible scenario. I don't. I don't. Yeah. I, I, l l let me take a whack at this. Uh, I've known Joe Biden for over 50 years. When I first met him, he wanted to be president of the United States. He thought he would be president a lot sooner. Uh, he didn't get there. Now he's there. He likes the job. He thinks he's done a good job. In some ways, he is substantively the most underappreciated president since, say, Harry Truman, who was reviled at the time he left office and is now thought of as a great or semi-great president. So I, I, I just don't think that, that that's in the cards at all. Uh, a lot of that will depend on if he beats Trump, though. Right. I mean, the, that yeah. legacy question, if he loses. There's yeah, no and he way. faces the same dilemma Truman did which is Truman had a splinter party on his left uh, with Henry Wallace and a splinter party on his right with the Dixiecrats and Strom Thurmond, who was still theoretically a Democrat at that point. Uh, nobody gave him a chance, and he won that election. Truman had a sad exit. He lost the New Hampshire primary and dropped out. Yeah, yeah, but that was the it's kind next of, time. It's yeah, kind of forgotten. Yeah. <laughs> um, recent book uh, I read by uh, John Judas, he co-authored Where Have All the Democrats Gone, f contained a nugget that I thought was quite scary for the Democrats, which is the shift of margin away from Democrats. I think Jane mentioned a little bit about that with, you know, male versus female. But what are the specific issues driving that trend and what happened to the coalition of the ascendant? Um, I think that the idea of an emerging democratic majority it kind of goes to what you were saying that there's this always a, every couple of years there's an idea that like this thing is going to happen and republicans slash democrats will never win anything ever again and we saw that in 2012 with this idea that there would just be that demographics would mean that democrats would win every election forever which was funny on a micro and macro level one because it ignored the fact that many, um, many non-white people are pretty conservative about issues. And we've seen that if voting patterns like in El Paso and elsewhere, but also if you just like know non-white people, you would know that like right. just in life. But um, I, I think that what has happened is that we, we routinely do this thing where we treat people in politics as just widgets we can move around. Like if we get more Latino voters, we can and get fewer white voters. And if we just get Latino Catholics, but we also get like this group of people and this group then of people. Then we can't lose. Then we can't lose and it can't happen. And like, that's not how people work. People are weird and complicated. And I think that that idea of like an ascendant majority or that, that there would be something you could do, like one weird trick that means that you'll never lose again, it has just never been true. The permanent majority. Yeah. I, we've heard that phrase over the years. Yeah. You know, and every time you hear it, what an absurdity. Yeah. Okay, we're going to try to get in two quick questions, one there, one there. And I'm, I apologize to the other folks who have been waiting in line. Go ahead. Okay, I have a question for Carissa. And unless it's a typo, it says you were an advisor to Joe Biden, and now you're in a senior position at Fox Corporation. <laughs> Um, uh, I sorry, I want to be clear. I'm sure you all. I was senior advisor in the Office of Public Engagement at the White House. So okay. I just want to clarify because those who are in the room who worked in government. So yes, but I did work in the Biden Harris White House. Okay, well, just based on your comments mm -hmm. now, I'm wondering if uh, we have, uh, or if we can look forward to a more uh, balanced or bipartisan uh, view from Fox News, which a lot of people in this country that's the only thing they watch. Uh, leading up to this election, it would have helped us a lot in 2016. Thank you. I will be sure to share that feedback back with my colleagues <laughs> over at Fox News, sir. Thank you for the question. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, first, I just want to say thank you specifically to Jane and Chris. I've really appreciated your answers. Um, and I wanted to talk to you both specifically. Um, I was wondering if you could touch on Colorado and the Supreme Court and how did you, what were your initial reactions to that? Where do you stand on that? Sort of thing now with their ruling? Um, I think that there are 
I'm trying to figure it. I'm filibustering you right now. Um, <laughs> I think that my first thought was totally understandable. This will not stand up. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it is, I, and I'm not going to give you the thing that people say where they're like, ah, you should beat him at the ballot box because the Democrats did. And then he was like, oh, and then a bunch of people came on January 6th and uh, then there were tanks everywhere in D.C. And it was really scary. And I didn't like that at all. Uh, once again, the if Jane Coaston doesn't like it thing, you know, that should work more. But um, <laughs> I do think I, I, I found, again, totally understandable decision from that court. I just don't think what I don't think that's going to stand up. I also don't think that that's good for how we think about the interactions um, between state and federal government. Um, I think, and you've already seen people like, we should just take Biden off the ticket or something like yeah. that. Like, you see that you don't want to get into the sort of state by state tit for tat. Um, I love federalism. I think it's awesome. I think it's very cool that you go to different states and they do different things. And we're all like, <laughs> great. Um, but I also think that for our country to to function as the United States, I think that there needs to be a, a for a national election, there has to be national access to the ballot. Yeah, if I could add, I, I on the merits, I think there is a national rule. It's in the 14th Amendment. But I think this court is going to look very hard to find a way out and to not prevent the former president from being on the ballot. Uh, so we're running out of time. I want to do a number of things. First, I want to do a big shout out to our partner in this venture, Politico. We just had a fabulous partnership with them a week ago. Uh, when we did the California U.S. Senate debate, I want to thank everybody in this audience. And I want to thank a terrific panel, Chris, uh, Jane Coaston, John McConnell, Carissa Smith, uh, thank everybody in the audience. We'll take about a 10 minute break and go get some coffee and then turn to our next session, which will focus on the November showdown, a general election, which actually seems to be beginning in January. See you shortly.